1950. I was born in Shelby County in, in uh, 1950, but uh, my mom had a house here in Taylorsville, so that's where I was reside, resided. So our house burned down, and we built it back, back when I was in the fifth grade. Then I went to Shelby County for a year and a half. My mom built the house back, and we moved back here. They called it Back Street. It's Garrett Street. Well, it's mostly blacks around there. Uh, uh, Bob Ehrman and Bud Mock and uh, Miss Susie the Sims and the Polks and uh, Bobby Ehrman and which is he was mayor here what three terms he's a black guy Bobby Ehrman Ryan's daddy and my daddy died when I was uh, ten months old my mother was pregnant with my brother Joey and um, so I really didn't know my dad so Bobby he helped raise and up along with other other parents around here because back then. One of them whooped you, all of them whooped you. <laughs> but anyway, we uh, they we they watched out for we watched out for one another. We had a certain time to be in. Life got dark, you know. You had to be in the house. That's back when we were younger. But as we they give us a little bit more freedom when we because uh, they worried about us, you know. Because back then it was black and white and all that. But but we uh we got along with everybody. Well, my mom she uh, she had nine kids. I'm one of nine kids. Ten count my sister Drew, but my father had her Drew Murphy Thompson. By uh, that is Sim. She worked for Foreman's Funeral Home down there for years and years, and she was the housekeeper and everything. We didn't have. Mama did the best she could, you know, because she had nine kids, and uh, you know, that's a big family. Like I said, my daddy died when I was ten months old, so I me, mean, Joey, and I would go with my sister sometime. And, but Mama was the main caregiver, and you know, she got married uh, the last time, and uh, she had four kids by her last husband, and uh, before she died, and uh, the older ones took care of the younger ones. And then we had every night, we had, you know, we learned how to cook, sew, on. We learned how to do it all because we had to because mom was busy trying to bring money in to help uh, finance her children. And she was a housekeeper around here for years and years and years and uh, worked at restaurants. She worked at the sweet shop uh, cooking and she uh, did housework. And she worked at the powder plant. She wound up at GE, same place I worked at. And... Uh, Anyway, she stayed at GE until she retired. Back then, we had to get out and work, you know. Mama, she did the best she could, but we couldn't, like, I couldn't go tell Mama if I wanted to go on a new pair of tennis shoes or something. I couldn't just go say, Mama, I need some money for tennis shoes. We had to go out and work and get, a, and get money for tennis shoes. It was just, uh, we came up hard. Uh, like I said, we learned how to cook so hard. Uh, we needed money, went out and worked. And, um, when we was going to the black school up there where the veterinary's office is, it's black and white, I mean black school, it was one through four, then four through eight, then they moved us around to the white school or you went to Lincoln Institute. And uh, up there where the locker is now, you know, the cows or something would get out, the pigs, they would let us out of school to go over and chase the pigs back into Bobby Black, Robert Black's daddy, he owned that then. We'd go chase the pigs and cows or whatever back in there and they'd give us 50 cents, a quarter, something like that, you know. we on top of the world getting that money, you know. And we worked for Trixie Henry up there at the hammer mill right up the street, scooping corn. I worked on all the farms out here, you know, cutting the back and putting in hay, and plus worked at GE too, so I knew a lot of all the farmers before they started raising soybeans and corn, you know. I helped on farms, and we just did what we had to do, and we didn't have football or basketball or driver's ed or anything at school, you know, when we went to the white school, so we would go out and play football in, in, in the graveyard, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we had fun, you know. And bicycles, uh, like I said, Mom had nine kids. Uh, we had a bicycle one time, couldn't afford a tar for it. We rode it on the wheel, just on the wheel. And uh, and we would ride it at night, and sparks would fly and everything, you know. <laughs> but, and I'd go around the curb, you to watch it, because it'd throw you on the blacktop and skin you up. The flood wall around there where my Mom's house is, uh, we had cargo boxes. We didn't have sleds, we had cargo boxes. And Mama, we went and got the car hood off old car one time. We dragged it up there. Mama would come out there and sleigh ride with us and everything. And, and every once in a while we'd get pulled behind a vehicle, you know, around here in town and stuff, you know, just 
that's how we had fun. As far as Christmas and candy, and we got candy and fruit and stuff. We didn't get any toys or anything because you know nine kids you couldn't couldn't do that. Plus we had a coal stove and a outside bathroom, and uh, I never will forget when we got the bathroom where you sat on it and the water started running. Oh Lord, we thought we was in heaven then, you know, because you go out there and the there's a robot catalog and that cold real cold and we had a slop jar at night you know you used it and then you had to empty it every morning we got that toilet outside where you sit on that thing that water wouldn't run and we uh you know well we cooked on the wood stoves had to stroke it up have to get the coal in and tricks and henry had a had a chicken houses we'd go catch those chickens and put them in the crates for the truck to come and get and whatever was left he would say Boys, they y'all, you have to get them in the morning, but it's hard to catch in daylight. We caught chickens at night because they would, they would all gather up and just stay, you know. And so the next day we'd go up there and catch all them chickens and we'd scald them, kill them, and, you know, dip them in, get the feathers off of them. That's what we had in the wintertime. And I would help keep them kill hogs and stuff and all the feet and the head and everything like that. We took home. Their mama would cook it for us, you know. So, you know, it was just, that was the way of life. I said the older ones, my pet sister Cynthia and Peggy and all of them, they helped take care of us, then we helped take, take care of the last four that Mama had. We survived. Which we got in trouble like everybody else, and we get spanking or whooping, and we just go swimming when they had no swimming pool. Now we go over behind Greenwood Brothers, I mean, uh, the funeral home over, and they call it Greenwood Hole. We go over and go swimming. And every time Mama catches over, I see whooped hell out of us because uh, her, her brother died with, uh, he drowned, and she didn't want us in the water. But well, we sneak over and go swimming anyway, but. But uh, when they found him, he ate a bunch of green apples and went swimming. And uh, when they found him, apples was coming out of his mouth. And she just didn't want us in that water. And before she died, I took her up the lake, put her in my boat, and rode around on the boat. She really enjoyed it, you know. But she uh, she was totally against us being in the water. She was stern. I mean, she was wasn't about five, five four, and she almost didn't get on G because she was too short. But she was meaner than a damn rattlesnake. Nine kids, she had to be mean, you know. But the, there's, there's some kind of thing where you had to be so tall to get on there, but they looked, they went ahead and harder, and she stayed there twenty something years. I mean, she she did her job. You know, she she was a worker. You know, she, she had to, you know, because nine kids you had to work. I've been working all my life. I just I had a '58 Ford and a purse mower. And I would take that car, which I give seventy five dollars for, and and uh, take it go around mow people's yards. And I put in hay. And I put in tobacco. You know, and scoop corn for Trixie, and we did what we had to do to get money. I worked at uh, Payson's down here, right across from uh, right across from Foreman's Street, uh, Hall Taylor, those buildings right there. I worked there, the, the Willets, their name was Willett, and they took me in, and uh, I worked there as a, a cleanup, you know, sweeping the floors, and Saturday morning I had to wash them big windows, and um, made 65 cents an hour, and they would, uh, they wouldn't give me all my money. They would put it in the bank for me. They give me part of it because I would go shoot pool, try to run it up, and make more money. They started me a savings account. And that's what they got me to save money years and years ago. Get part of it, and then I would save part of them. And Jenny had a house over there where we bought the lot, uh, right there behind Bennett's. Well, right beside Bennett. Before we cleaned that off, and Jenny had a house. And she was blind, but she played the piano. And I would go get her coal and wood and stuff in, and uh, she would put get give me money, and she was blind, but she could count money. Yeah. And she put it in a jar for me. When I get it full, I take that and put it in the bank. Warren Bennett had to tell about her. Said uh, she's walking down the street one day. And she's blind, and uh, Warren Bennett dropped a dollar bill or something or other, and she been over, picked it up, and kept going. <laughs> he told that tale on her for years and years and years. But she was blind, but I bet she could see a little bit. But all that behind the church was all black community. Miss Tenney, Miss Sally, they had a house back there. Uh, Aunt Jenny had a house back there. A lot we bought, it was Allen's that owned that, and Rodney bought it from them. Rodney Cochran, he was a black guy, he worked for Greenwood Brothers hauling gas and stuff. And he bought that from the Allen's before they died. And Rodney helped, he felt like uh, my brother in law Wallace and Bobby Irvin. They, all those older men bought us up. You know, they they, they took us on, uh, Bobby would take us on bicycle tours when we uh, had a little 4 H thing, you know, and Bobby would take us on. He wouldn't give us a bicycle. He, he would, he would give us a piece of junk, and then he would help us fix it up. But he wouldn't fix it, but he'd show us how to fix it. I bought my first bicycle from him. I'd give him $25 for it, and I'd pay for it, $2, $3 a week. And uh, that 58 Ford I had, I'd get paid on that, $5, $10 a week. My gold tooth, uh, 
Dr. Strong down here. It wasn't gold that back then. It was just I got in a fight and broke it off, and and it, it um, finally turned this black. And he said, "Well, I'll put a whole uh, and I'd pay him five dollars a week to pay it off." <laughs> and he said, "One of these days, it just fall out because it's dead." And when he did the rookie down on it, he didn't even numb it. He says, "You feel less and all." He said it was dead, you know, it's black, you know, it's going to fall. So one of these days it fall out, never has. But, but anyway, Dr. Strong did that, and he knew he knew my family, so he, I made him $5 a week to pay for my tooth. <laughs> but we didn't have dental insurance, about, you know. You know, like, we made a, we made a, all the kids made their own fun. You know, we had fun, but we, we stayed within the ranks where we lived at. We didn't uh, venture out too far because we had to be home, and if lights, when it got, got dark, and you know, all the, Nine kids, all of us had a job. We had to wash dishes, clean up the kitchen, and do all that. And if you didn't do it, you made sure it was done. Because if you didn't, both of you were going to get a whooping. I worked on cars. I started working with Charles when I was about 14. Because I would get off at Casings, 65 cents an hour, and I would walk up the street, and I would work, work for Charles Smith. He had that Texaco station right across from Bennett's. When I started off washing cars there, I made 2 or $3, you know, here and there, and washing cars. And, I ended up working for him. I started changing the oil and fixing tires and putting brakes in. And, I, you know, I learned. I just sat and watched him do stuff, so I learned how to do it, too. I started working for him when I was 14. I quit when I was 64, when I blew my knee out. Now I met a lot of people down there. A lot of people just, they like me, and I, they trust me with their car. A lot of people, I would go I would go to their house, get their house 5 o'clock in the morning, and they'd leave the key where I could find it, and I'd go get the car and take it up there and change it. Don't take it back and park it back in their driveway. They trusted me that much because they knew I was good, good at what I did. But I also worked at GE. You know, I worked at GE and I worked a lot of overtime. Then on weekends, I I get off on Friday night. I work a double shift. Get off at twelve eighteen. They say, uh, "Well, you can rest tomorrow." I said, "Rest." I said, "I got to open up that station at six o'clock in the morning. You gonna work tomorrow?" I said, "Well, yeah." Years ago, when we all they had six stations, one on each corner. And they would take turns opening up on Sunday, and so uh, when it come Sunday time for us to open up on Sunday, work for Smith. Me and my wife would open it up. She would take the money off the gas pumps, and I would do the changing the oil, fixing tires, and everything. And we worked on commission. You know, she's a worker. I mean, my wife's really she's she's a hell of a worker. I mean, she's always worked ever since we've been married. But she's a landscaper. She's a painter. She's a housewife. She she uh. She's a worker. She spent 32 years at GE. I spent 38. She spent 32. Then she finally retired. I, don't, I met a lot of good people down there, and I, let, I met a lot of bad people. And I, I made a lot of friends. This guy I played golf with, he said, man, you go to a lot of funerals and wakes and stuff. I, said, I know a lot of people. And people around here knew my mom, and she knew that we were good workers, and uh, we just did what we had to do. My mom had a job. She cooked and everything. That she went around cleaning up these offices like the library. My wife, she would come around there, and, and she would, uh, which I was ripping and running everywhere. <laughs> and I said, I just asked her, I said, "Hey, girl, when are you gonna take me out?" You know, and she looked at me just lag. You know, she called me one night when she was going to a party. Wanted to know if I would uh, take her. I said, "Are you crazy?" Yeah, I'll take you. You know, and we did. And so anyway, we uh, we hooked up, and uh, we've been together ever since. <laughs> Yeah, I quit my running. Kind of cut down after that, but we started dating her, and um, that's what she knew. I was a little bit crazy, so and uh, her daddy was a deacon in church, and he told her, said, "You make your bed hard, you're gonna lay in it, cause you'll be back home in three months, cause you ain't gonna change him. He's crazy." Which I did stay in trouble quite a bit, but ripping and running, having fun, but clean fun, you know, out running cops, and <laughs> one night. Uh, I split town in the car. It belonged to Gary McLean, and the uh, next morning they went and got him, going to lock him up, and said, uh, that eyewitness said it was him driving that car. He had a 66 Chevelle with a 396, and it, it was bad. 96 uh, L88, uh, big block motor. Cops came back to me. They, they couldn't catch that car. I went up the hill. Carl Schaus, he used to deliver mail around here. He, uh, he had a carport up there, and I turned it off and coasted underneath his carport. And, <laughs> and the cop went by, went toward the old road, going up to Pound Hill. And it's a 66 Chevy Bel Air. <laughs> and that couldn't touch that, that Chevelle. So I went back to town the other way. So they locked Moose up and told him, got an eyewitness, and said it was a white guy driving the car. And I said, 
Gary got out of jail and he came over and he said, uh, they come and got me this morning, locked, locked me up, said it was my car, said, got an eyewitness, said it was, I was driving. And I said, well, let me finish eating breakfast, I'll go take care of it. So anyway, uh, uh, I went over and saw Jesse Keelan, he was the judge in. And when I said, Jesse, uh, I have something to tell you. He said, what's that? He said, I said, I was one split town in a car last night. He said, what? He said, we got an eyewitness said it was Gary. I said, no, it wasn't Gary, it's me. And he said, uh, you confessing to me? And I said, yeah, I guess I am. They took his license, I mean, took points off his license. They're going to they gonna tear him up. He said, you remember you were the first confession I ever had? I said, really? <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, I'll take care of it. And he dropped all the charges on Moose and everything, you know. Never did charge me, but anyway. He said, you're the first one I've ever had, and I'm going to take care of you. But see, also, uh, I'd been in trouble before with him because they called me one night down there in town. I had my gun on me and uh, didn't have a permit or anything. Back in, you didn't have a permit, but back in, you carried a gun because I stayed in a lot of trouble. On my, every week, I got to pay the GE. I had to go make a installment payment at the courthouse. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh about this, but I was up at a station worker one day and he bought my gun back up there. Here's your gun. You paid your bill. I said, ain't my gun. He said, what? He said, it's not my gun. Uh, my gun was nicer than that. that. That's a piece of junk. He said, you sure that's not yours? No, it's not mine. I'll tell you right now. Because they locked him up in the safe down there. Somebody stole my gun out of the safe. He said, I'll take care of it. I said, okay. So I went and kept working. About two weeks later, he came up there and said, like you, he said, sign this. And uh, he bought me a brand new gun and bought it and gave it to me. Judge, he liked me. You know, this, uh, he knew I was good for it. You know, he knew I wouldn't lie to him. But well, he bought me a new gun, and I knew his family real well. Because I knew all the farmers, because I worked for them. Putting in the back and hay and everything, they, all of them liked me, you know. So. And they treated us real nice. And they ate the same table with them and everything. I mean, we did. We, we, there wasn't no black and white stuff back then. We, the old people, they just they fed us, and we went back in the field and worked again. Everybody, we, everybody got along. <clears throat> and, uh, I came back to Chevy County, and um, I think it was in fifth grade. Fifth grade. And... Uh, I had Miss Winter, Teresa's mother, and um, she taught me and Slick and Cheryl. Well, 60, one of us in the class when we graduated, was three blacks, me and James Bowen and Cheryl Downs. They saw that, saw that we wasn't going to take no stuff, so we, they left us alone. We got along. We just mingled in, you know. I think they could have been a little more fire with some of our athletes, like my brother-in-law, Donald Moran and Harvey. They were, they tried out for the Reds. That's how good they were at baseball and stuff. Up Nevin. Slick, all of them was real good, you know. And some of them got cut, but Donald, some of them they couldn't keep off the field because it, back then, if you didn't have the right name, you didn't have any money, you weren't gonna play. But some of some of some of us blacks was, was so talented they couldn't keep them off the field. And baseball, um, baseball, Harvey Brown and Donald, they were too tough. I mean, they couldn't keep Harvey. My brother-in-law pitched a no-hitter. I mean, that's how good he was. He tried out for the Reds, Donald Moran, all them. They, they was tough. Me, I, I didn't. I worked two jobs. I didn't play a lot of sports, but I played in pickup games and stuff like that. But if they wanted to win, they had to play them. They had to play them because it was too good. It was talented. Charlie Downs, Slick, Booby, Nevin, all of them were. The churches played one another. I mean, every and the, those bleachers over there would be full. They came to see us get beat. wasn't going to happen. I mean, we we got to be there once in a while, but it wasn't too often. I mean, we were, we were good back then. Over there by our church, it was all, all black. And up here on the, the hill behind uh, uh, the veterinary place, most of that was black too. All, all the blacks lived there. It's back street against the railroad. We called them the railroad, we was back street. And we, we'd fight them, the blacks, against black against black. You know, we was having fun. We'd throw rocks at one another. We got to the, we got to the rock pal. We had to get, them boys could throw some rocks. I mean, we had to get a, we had to go on back around on the back other end of town. They could, they could throw them rocks. I'm telling you. But uh, Mr. Downs, we had uh, two black teachers up there, Mr. Downs, Miss Emily Houston, and uh, Richard Downs, and uh, they and they they catch us fighting. You know, they whoop us the next day. But uh, we didn't care. They would feed us. And we'd go up there. And we would, they had a stove back there, and they would feed us. Uh, bread with cheese on it, then they would fix a big pot of white, white beans or brown beans or something. We had lunch, we had our own, well, they cooked it for us, you know, but that's, that's what we ate up there. If you didn't have lunch, you had lunch, because they'd make sure you had something to eat.
Hey, Master Mr. Downs, one time, I said, uh, uh, why? Well, like one, one time, the state's capital deviations, Gettysburg's address, and the preamble, you had to learn it. And he'd stand up there, put you up there at that blackboard, and you, he asked you something, you better answer it. If he didn't, he'd whoop you. And I mean, he, and penmanship, he, he was very strict on penmanship. Very, very strict. And I asked him, I said, why were you so hard on us when we was in that black school up there? He said, I knew this was coming. You was going to the white school, and I wanted you to be prepared, and I wanted you to be, in, I wanted you to be ahead of them. And we were, we were, we were a little bit ahead of the white kids when we got around there. Yeah, my mom cooked at the sweet shop down there where the teacup is now. It's a restaurant back there called the sweet shop. My mom cooked there, and I couldn't even go in there and sit down and eat. Oh, no. I couldn't go in there and sit down and eat. My, my mom was a cook. I couldn't go in there and sit down and eat. Linda's, over where Linda's is at, I couldn't go in there and sit down and eat. None of us could. And one night, <laughs> you know me, uh, me and Bo Dilly and Slick, all those, we ordered a bunch of hamburgers from Keo. His name was Keo Man Manley. And, uh, all right, okay, boys, got your food, get out of here. I said, we ain't going no damn work. We ain't going nowhere. What'd you say? I said, we ain't going no damn work. And we stayed in there, ate a hamburger, he called the law on us. So we walked down the street, we had a bunch of us singing, we shall overcome. And we got over on the church, the old church, not the church now. It had steps on there. Here comes the state trooper. But it's black gloves on, he's going to beat the hell out of us. And uh, some of the white people come on on there and said, no, they, no, leave them alone. They own their property, leave them alone. That uh, cop, which I won't mention his name, but he got out of that car with his gloves on. He's going to try to, he's going to whoop the hell out of us, you know. But uh, and the white people said, no, they own their property, leave them alone. And uh, so he left, you know. He said, y'all, no, leave them alone. And that was sort of the beginning because we got, we got tired of it, you know, because, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't go and sit down to eat. No. No, it was back in. That's the way it was. We could go out and work on the farms, but we couldn't and sit down and eat with them. And but when we went to the farms, they would take us in the house or out on the back porch. But we all ate together, the blacks and the whites. We ate together, you know. But but no, these restaurants and stuff. Oh no, being on the welcome is just a, that's the way it was back in, and we knew it. Just like when you went to GE, they had a black water fountain and a white water fountain. When I was at GE, <laughs> me, I'm about to act crazy, but. Uh, uh, I, I mingled with people. I mean, I was one of the leaders. And uh, we had this old Nazi in there. He's a Nazi. And uh, I worked there. And I've been there in that same building for years and years. And uh, he would put out uh, Ku Klux Klan stuff in the bathrooms and stuff, you know. And I knew who was doing it. And uh, some, some, some of the white people told me who was doing it. And uh, some of those girls down there, white girls, I'd rub them run up to him and kiss him, you know, and hug on him and stuff. He'd look at me and his ears were turning red. Oh, Lord, he hated me. I mean, he hated me. Because, you know, he didn't like me to touch white women. <laughs> I'd do it just for meanness. <laughs> we, you know, we knew which ones, you know. We know. Some in Mount Eden. Some up there still yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> uh, which I don't call names, but, uh, yeah, that was a grand, grand master was down there, uh, down there to uh, Bully County, down Shepherdsville. Oh yeah, I used to go on the uh, Bill Tipton. He owned Elk Creek Grocery, and I used to go with him on that sausage truck. And he told me, uh, Sherman, Sherman, Sherman Adams. I think that's his name. I think that was his name. I shouldn't be calling names, but he was a grand master down there. And Bill, when I went up to him on his sausage truck, I said, Bill, you know I'm, <laughs> I ain't supposed to be down here. He said, Don't worry about you with me. And I used to go with him all the time, and he would let me know. You know, I, I said, Yeah, I know where I'm at. You know. But uh, back then was the way of life, but sometimes you just get tired of putting up with stuff. You know, you just have to, you got to revoke. And so we did, and but it got better and better, you know. Like we went to the white school and we uh, we got along with them, you know, Roger and Gary Truax. And I mean, I just, uh, I, I, I don't take so much, then I blow up. But back then I was really bad about blowing up. But, you know, I got, you know, my wife said, You're crazy. I said, I'm, my mama told you that before you married me. My daughter, we just had one daughter, uh, she went through the same thing after school, you know, she, she played basketball and stuff, but, and uh, some people say, well, Amy didn't go through no stuff, but Amy, Amy, Amy went through some stuff, y'all just don't know. She would tell me, you know, because one, one boy called her name one time and she, she beat the hell out of him. And, hey, they messed with her. She got a short fuse. <laughs> 
she got a sharp view like her mama. Most time, but we wasn't real, 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 real sick. You didn't go to the doctor. I mean, uh, I stuck a stop up my foot one time, jumping out of a boat, and uh, uh, went to, mama got a bunch of kerosene, put it in a bucket, soaked it in there, wrapped it up, and that was it. Kerosene and, and, uh, and linseed oil and, and Vaseline uh, fixed staff, that was, you know, they didn't, you didn't go to the doctor. I fell out of a pear tree around in my mom's house and broke my collarbone, showing off. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Sk Dr. Snyder went with Dr. Skaggs. It was two doctors, Dr. Snyder and Dr. Skaggs. And he came around there and looked at it and said, yeah, he broke his collarbone. And uh, he took some duct tape and taped my arm like that, duct tape. And, uh, and that was it until, I, until he took, come and took it off so I could use my arm. And the whooping I got after I after he left was worse than the damn duct tape. I mean, Mama beat the hell out of me because I fell out of the damn tree. You know, kerosene, you know, Mama, you'd get cut or anything. I mean, you, uh, kerosene. She used kerosene all the time. We had a coal, we had a wood stove or a coal stove, a coal stove, and uh, she would uh, put a pan of water on, put a big sap in it, and rub it on your chest, you went to bed. This finger right here, that's, uh, I used to pick up pop bottles and sell them. I got up the store one day and I couldn't get that one off. And uh, Mama did everything. She did everything. Stoked it. I mean, she did everything. Still couldn't get it off. She said, put it up on the table. She took a damn hammer and hit it. See that knot right there? She took a hammer and hit it and broke that bottle off her and split my finger wide open. But she got it off, took that, put, put the kerosene, put it in the kerosene, wrapped it up. I mean, with health care, we didn't. I mean, you had to be really dying before you could go to the doctor. I mean, with that back end, the doctors didn't hardly char charge nothing. As far as health care, your mama was your health care. <laughs> your mama was your health care. You know, back then, they give you a photo shot. And they had people, I, that's what I don't understand about people not wanting to take the COVID shot. And I got one in each arm. I got a flu shot and I got a COVID shot. I mean, what's so hard about taking a shot? I mean, if it's going to prolong my life, I mean, if I'd be here with my grandkids and my daughter and my wife, why not take a little old shot? I mean, I went down the other day and got blood drawn just to, just so I could go to the doctor, you know, ahead of time, just so I wouldn't have to do it when I get down there. Anyway, we just uh, we do what we can to help the community, which I'm on the Board of Adjustments and here, and uh, uh, I do a lot of church work. We do a lot of church work. For me, I, when they told me uh, years ago, they said work hard and save you money. And uh, my mom told me, said, you give a man good days work, you always have a job. I never have had a job. I never have been far from a job. I've worked two jobs, three jobs all my life. I mean, I worked at the station. I worked at GE. I did photography for 20 something years, doing weddings and stuff. Uh, I cut the bag, I put in hay. Uh, uh, you, gotta, you gotta have a plan. Kids now, how are you gonna pay for a car and pay for a house payment and, and have kids? And how are you gonna do that if you don't work? And a lot of them, if they can bum a cigarette and a beer, uh, they happy. They don't. They don't want nothing. They don't. They don't. They don't act like we did. We always want something better. They. They just. They just want to get by. I don't understand that. My grandson, he got a scholarship to U of L. I mean, full boat. I mean, he works with the football team. He, he does the videography stuff for the football team, and he travels with the team and stuff. But he's got, he's got made. I mean, he's got an apartment. He's got, they got, UofL gave him a, a car, you know, where he puts money in his account. He worked for the school and still got a full ride to UofL. And my granddaughter, she's a freshman at Mayo, and she's, she dances with the dance team and stuff, you know. And, I, and they workers, they, they, they uh, I get it from my grandmom, I guess. I mind still in my daughter to work, you know, to to. Uh, but it was in her anyway. She just she just went ahead and knew what she had to do and, and did it. Made me work. I had that land out there, and uh, I would leave home in the morning. Had a thirty-two inch lawnmower. Play. I'd be mowing grass. She'd be mowing grass when I left in the morning. When I got back home that evening, she'd still be mowing grass. But <laughs> she's out on that lawnmower all day. And, but she worked. I mean, she got what she wanted, but she worked. The people that's got everything, got money. Some people still ain't happy. We're happy. We're a happy family. It, to talk about things, 
just don't bother me because people uh, people have treated me well. Now that said, people try to mistreat me. That don't, that don't go well. <laughs> that don't go well at all. Taylorsville has changed. It's uh, it's not like it used to be. I remember years ago, uh, the water would get up in the street, and I've seen boats run up and down, run up and down Main Street. Boats. I mean, I've seen all that. I've I've cleaned up houses. I've cleaned out mud. I've, we've done there. You know, it's just what we've been through. Uh, you think about it. You're blessed just to be here because I've been in car wrecks and everything else and shot at and cut up, fingers cut off and stabbed in the arm. And, uh, you know, I'm just lucky to be here. A buddy of mine came up to me one day and told me he wanted my gun. And I said, what? So I said, I got a guy after me. I'm going to need to borrow your gun. And I said, well, so I gave him, gave him my gun. He stuck it in his pocket and shot himself in the butt. I had to take him to the doctor. <laughs> Oh Lord! And uh, I took one down there, Billy K. Billy K. Skaggs, and uh, we rolled him around on the table. And uh, he hadn't bled a drop. The powder burned him so bad. And he was laying there. And he said, "I ain't gonna die. I'm a, I ain't gonna die." And I started laughing because I was flipping him over trying to find a bullet. Found a, found a bullet it was way down his ankle. He traveled all the way down, wasn't that everybody's saying? Followed that bone all the way down there. But people, uh, there's different cultures. There's different. Sexes, there's different everything, but you know, if you treat people right, you're gonna get along with them. You're just best to be here, so it's best to just take it in stride and get along with people and do what you need to do. I don't, I don't mind helping people, but if you if you help somebody take three steps forward and, and look around, they take two steps backwards. Now we got to talk because this I'm not gonna waste. My, I'm not saying I'm not gonna waste my time. I, I'm gonna love you and try to help you, but. You got to straighten up. It's just not feasible to keep giving, 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 and, and you don't take nothing in. I never thought that I would be living where I was living and have what I, what we accomplished together. Uh, I dreamed about it. I always dreamed about it. I wanted what I want what they got. I want what they got. You know. But you got to keep. You got to have the strive and the and the, op, the opportunities are there if you apply yourself. If you don't apply yourself, but you, what the Lord says, you're gonna leave here with the same thing you came here with. Which is true, but you got to be comfortable. I mean, just try to live life to the fullest and be comfortable and try to treat people right.